Now, I don't have kids, but I am a scientist, and from what I can tell about raising children, the big thing to remember is that you brought them into this world, and so they are your responsibility. So get independent backup generators for your electric fences. If your central Unix surface grows down, hurricane, industrial espionage, whatever, you want those fences active. Bonus tip, using frog DNA is a bad idea because of the potential issues with unplanned reproduction. Hello, I'm Dr. Peter Allen, bioanalytical chemist. On weekends, I like to make these little comics and videos. Thanks very much to Snowman for the great art on this comic. I think they did a great job. Quick content warning. This week, I'm going to talk about how Michael Crichton, the author of Jurassic Park, got it wrong about scientific consensus, and it's going to touch on some political issues. Now, the film Jurassic Park was made in 1993, so I am not going to be careful about spoilers. If you're unfamiliar, uh, due to a lack of cultural osmosis, in the movie, the scientists bring back dinosaurs and it goes poorly. In the movie, Jeff Goldblum famously says, Life uh, finds a way. And that's sort of the theme of the film. Despite being extinct, dinosaurs come back. Despite being all female, the dinosaurs end up changing their sex and hatching some eggs. Maybe the movie was supposed to be about the hubris of man. Life and biology is bigger and smarter than us. There are always unforeseen consequences of our actions, and thus we must be extra careful. Except it, it doesn't really work that way as a cautionary tale, because unextinctifying dinosaurs would be awesome. None of the kids walking out of the theater said, Boy, I sure hope they don't clone dinosaurs. That would be a bad thing. Because, because this wasn't fun at all. Gaining knowledge will always have unintended consequences, but that's no reason to abandon science. In fact, it's a great argument for learning more, seeking more knowledge, more carefully, going about things systematically, and seeking scientific consensus regarding policy. Michael Crichton, the author of the book upon which the movie was based, was deeply skeptical of what he called scientific consensus. See, he took issue with the view that climate change is real and a threat. Quoting from Michael Crichton in an interview, Let's be clear, the work of science has nothing whatever to do with consensus. Consensus is the business of politics. Science, on the contrary, requires only one investigator who happens to be right, which means that he or she has the results that are verifiable by reference to the real world. In science, consensus is irrelevant. What is relevant is reproducible results. And look, up to a point, this is correct. Consensus is a rule of thumb. More of a guideline. But consensus is a mechanism for those outside the field to get some insight about what's going on inside a field. And yes, consensus is always secondary to the prime authority of experiment. But Crichton continued, the greatest scientists in history are great precisely because they broke with the consensus. Now we're edging into misleading. Yes, the final authority of science is experiment, not consensus. Yes, scientists had to break with consensus to present truly novel theories, hypotheses, results. But problem one with this perspective is that it makes it seem like breaking with consensus makes you more likely to be correct. If you make 100 measurements and there's one outlier, that's not the most likely to be right. Get on all morning. How about that little fella? Or that little guy? I wouldn't worry about that little guy. Should we take outliers seriously? Re-examine our assumptions? Yeah, absolutely. This isn't about that. This is about multiple fields of measurement, observations, and theory. Biologists observing species changing where they live. Chemists making observation of the heat storing and reflecting capacity of atmospheric gases. Climatologists with decades of precise satellite measurements. Paleontologists with millennia of climate observations indirectly. It's about all of that pointing at a clear set of conclusions and that all being dismissed because there's snow one day in December in one northern city. That data point, it's not even an outlier. And even if it were an outlier, it doesn't disprove the trend. And one outlier scientist, one dissenter, is not somehow the most likely to be right. Problem two, dissent is critical for the work of science, but consensus is helpful for making policy. And yeah, we're going to talk about politics a little bit. See, climate change is happening. And we should do some things about it. Take this proposition. If we continue as we are going, by 2100, most of the Florida Keys will be underwater. Now that's either true or not. We might have a consensus prediction among climate scientists on what the odds are for that outcome. But in the end, 
2100 will arrive and the keys will either be above the water or below it. But right now, the people living there need to decide what to do, and they're probably not going to go get their PhDs in climate science. So for today, what rule of thumb should the people in the Keys use to guide their policy? That includes their personal choices, like whether to sell their land to some other sucker and move away, but also collective local government policy. Should the town build piers instead of roads, invest in importing dirt and rock to build up the islands? The final authority, the measurement, the fact, the actual water level on January 1st, 2100, that will be obvious, but that will be too late to be of help in the project of living on the Florida Keys. The hell is that? Problem three. The story of the lone dissenter is dramatic and it's appealing, but that makes it work really well for bad faith arguments. What's a bad faith argument? It's a sustained form of deception, which consists of entertaining or pretending to entertain one set of feelings while acting as if influenced by another. It may involve intentional deceit of others or self-deception. Crichton's take on consensus has been quoted by people who do not believe in climate change and by people who do not believe in evolution. They want to suggest that the fact that dissent exists is reason to disbelieve the science. It's reason to disbelieve evolution exists or that climate is changing. The idea that a lone dissenter plays into a frustrating narrative of we, the persecuted minority, must stand up to them and their cruel suppression of our views. This is the deceptive bit. It takes the natural consequences of being wrong and pretends that those consequences are the same as persecution. See, the world is a globe. The scientific consensus on that is correct. Arguing the contrary will mean that serious people are going to stop listening to you. You are not entitled to their attention. And that's not persecution. Gravity and evolution are not real because of the consensus around it. They're just things that we observe, like the water level on January 1st, 2100. They are a measurable phenomenon that some of us, including myself, have seen with our own two eyes in the lab, and we're seeing it in the spread of new variants of SARS-CoV-2 in real time. Evolution is not a prediction about the distant future or past, but observable phenomena that are happening now. Claiming that dissent is met with persecution is a lie designed to breed sympathy and hide the fact that there's no good evidence against evolution. Evolution by selection, in this case artificial selection, is a thing I have seen in the lab. We have forced it to happen. We forced DNA to evolve to bind thioflavin T and glow. That's a thing that we did. That there's no good evidence against human-caused climate change. All of the arguments that people make to suggest that climate change isn't real have been long disproven. They are being made in bad faith by people who know they are wrong in order to serve an agenda. Every single one of their arguments is in a long comprehensive list that you can look up and see that it has been debunked. They haven't said anything new for years. All right, that's my rant. What can we do about all this? We can donate to ncse.org. The National Center for Science Education supports teachers by providing teaching resources to help students understand climate change and evolution. They also fight laws that would censor teachers. I'm not affiliated, but I think they're great. We can donate to aclu.org. The American Civil Liberties Union goes to court to represent people who are really actually being censored, not just who feel they are. That includes climate scientists when the government has tried to silence them. I donate to the ACLU every month. We can support local scientific education, including things like local science fairs.